Hello my beautiful watchers, words that here mean subscribers on YouTube who mean a great deal to me, and welcome back to a series of unfortunate reviews. Words that here mean a guy who doesn't care for Daniel Handler's writing talking about the second season of the adaptation of his work by successful video streaming website Netflix. Seeing as you guys were kind enough to wait patiently for these episodes to make a comeback while I sorted my disentanglement from my former beloved community website, I decided I need to go the extra mile when I finally did them, so let's talk about the books a bit more before we jump back into the show. Before that though, please take note of this mighty spoiler warning. When you're dealing with a long-running series of books that are all tied into one another and have been adapted multiple times over the years, you can't really talk about just the one you're concentrating on right now. I might have to bring up stuff that hasn't featured in this show yet, or even the ending to the whole thing, so if you watch this without having read all the books and or watched all the available movies and episodes, you might have a twist or two ruined for you. Okay, so I am aware that my opinion on these books is not very popular. It's not quite the same as saying that you hate the Harry Potter novel, or that you love Twilight, but these books mean a lot to some people, and it does seem to sadden them that I harbour such a deep, visceral dislike for them. Now, I strive to be a man of strong principles, so I would never change my opinions simply to please people, but I thought that maybe if I sought a greater understanding as to why they appeal to others, it might help me enjoy these books more. To this end, I put the question of what people enjoy about reading them to my followers on Twitter. Well, actually what I said was, WHAT IS THE APPEAL OF THE SADISTIC FORMULAIC CRAP?! Which admittedly is not the best way to open a rational dialogue about something's pros and cons, but fortunately for me, my beautiful watchers were kind enough to oblige me with some anyway. I, uh... I was in a bad place at the time, I'm sorry. Several themes emerged from fans of the book, uh, the first of which seems to be there's a clear, chartable parallel between how happy your childhood was and how much you relate to one of the main recurring themes of the book, i.e. adults are all idiots and will never listen to you no matter how many times you've been proven right in the past. And I cannot refute this theory, quite the opposite in fact, I had quite a happy childhood with two easygoing, loving parents, so my lack of appreciation for the books makes perfect sense in this context. I do appreciate that this sort of thing is an effective way to appeal to a younger audience, as it was also a part of the early Harry Potter books, albeit in a much more subtle way. Therein lies the root of my issue with it, I think. I mean, it's far too on the nose for me in a series of unfortunate events. These adults aren't Professor McGonagall, you know, very competent but harbouring an unfortunate habit of underestimating children out of a sense of overprotectiveness. They're all without fail complete morons who never would have been able to make it through a single day in reality, and I just can't appreciate writing that's so devoid of subtlety. Probably another side effect of me reading these books far too late in life, I guess. Uh, as I've said before, without nostalgia, they really don't stand up well to an adult audience, in my opinion. Another prominent argument that was made in these books favour is that they are not in fact a product of mean-spirited sadism and an immature lack of human empathy like I claimed, but actually a story of unbreakable hope and determination in the face of continuous adversity, as the Baudelaire orphans always face every new terrible situation with a sense of optimism and unfailing love for one another. Unfortunately, as nice as that sounds, I just cannot get behind that theory at all, because while it is true that the Baudelaire orphans never give up and are always there for each other, the books are also constantly reminding you that they won't ultimately get a happy ending after all this, so the message you're left with isn't never lose hope, it's hope won't save you. You can never lose faith and always face every new challenge united together with your loved ones, but at the end of the day, everyone you care about will die or leave you, and you'll probably end up drowning after the ship named after your mother sinks, and or being eaten by a giant allegorical sea monster shaped like a question mark! Sorry, I uh, hope you paid attention to the spoiler warning. So, yeah, I think I do have a better appreciation for why other people are fans, but it didn't end up giving me a greater appreciation for these books, I'm sorry. On top of that, there's still the issue of these books being exceptionally formulaic, um, a subject I'll discuss in more detail at the end of this group of reviews so I can call upon more examples. Another issue that I just can't seem to get over is the fact that the world that these books are set in is so surreal and cartoonishly unrealistic, I just can't relate to anything that goes on in it. My mind just switches off after a while. A vice principal that mocks, bullies, and physically restrains his students while openly embezzling funds in a school with no time off on weekends? I mean, he would go straight to jail, he would not pass go, and he would not collect $200. Look, I'm a guy who likes science fiction and high fantasy novels, so I know about the suspension of disbelief, but once you've established that this is the kind of world in which this sort of thing is acceptable and legal, it wipes away a lot of the indignant sense of injustice I'm supposed to feel about it. Segwaying into a slight tangent, people seem to like it when I critiqued the Ready Player One audiobook, so I downloaded a few of these books on Audible, and they're actually kind of interesting. 
though there still isn't an advertisement for them. The first two are narrated by Tim Curry, obviously before the poor man had that terrible stroke, and he is so good at it. I mean, it might be unfair to say this because it's just the voice he's doing and not the whole shebang, but he is by far my favourite version of Count Olaf. The big problem that I mentioned about Jim Carrey and Neil Patrick Harris being too charismatic and likeable to play the villain wasn't a problem at all here, because Curry has so much experience playing antagonists, it's kind of his jam. However, after that, for whatever reason, they switched to Daniel Handler himself as the narrator, and he is nowhere near as good at it because... Well, he's an author, not an actor, uh, which might be why they switched back again to Tim Curry three books later. One of the end results of this is, if you're just listening to these books instead of reading them, the Baudelaire orphan's accents seem to go back and forth between British and American quite a lot. Seriously though, Handler's choices in that audiobook are so bizarre, like, he reads Sir as if he's a robot, like, he's like, hmm, orphans, I am offering you a good deal, this is a good deal to work in my lumber mill. I'm also given to understand that there's an alternative version of at least The Bad Beginning that was Curry Handler and some of the cast of the 2004 movie, including Meryl Streep, so even though I've not heard it yet, I'm willing to bet that's the one to aim for if you have the option. So, finally on to season 2 of the Netflix adaptation, and... <sighs> Look... I swear, I tried to go into this one in a better headspace, I really did. I don't know how many of you remember the last minute revelation I came to about this show in the Miserable Mill episode last year, but basically I realised that it actually made perfect sense that the show was making radical changes from the books, even though they hired Handler himself to write it, if you assume that he wished that he thought of and introduced the volunteer fire department conspiracy stuff right from the start and he's treating the Netflix original as his chance to reboot it and do it better this time. So even though once again Again, the main issue of this adaptation isn't so much that they discarded the original plot entirely, but that it got buried underneath a ton of new subplots and show-only scenes, I thought that keeping this in mind would help me be more accepting of all the additions to the episode. But. Even taking that into account and forgiving the VFD stuff, so much of what they jammed in was so pointless and it went all kinds of nowhere. So much nowhere, you guys. As usual though, they stuck to at least the skeleton of the original plot. The gravestone themed school, the horrible vice principal, a nasty girl called Carmelita Spatz, the surviving two quagmire triplets, the orphan shack full of fungus and crabs, and Olaf turning up in a turban and running shoes claiming to be a gym teacher called Genghis. Olaf trying to tie the Baudelaire's out so much running laps having night that they flunk class, fail their tests and get sent away with him for homeschooling, and the Quagmires taking their places to give them a chance to study for their tests, resulting in them passing, but the Quagmires getting kidnapped instead. I'll get onto the other padding in just a moment. Uh, in regards to the VFD though, this is technically the first book that it's actually mentioned in. I mean, it's literally just someone yelling VFD right at the end with no context or explanation, but it does at least show that Handler had the idea in his head at this point. Now you would think that this would mean that the VFD stuff wouldn't feel so crowbarred in and contradictory to the plot from now on, but unfortunately because they brought it in so early it's now escalated way past the point that I, I think they ever got to in the books. Moving on from that, the makers of this second season clearly faced a difficult choice. Do they acknowledge a bunch of stuff that doesn't make sense, either because the books are full of plot holes or because of the adaptation process, or quietly ignore them? They evidently chose to lampshade the shit out of every last thing. They reference child labour laws in regards to their time at the lumber mill, they talk about how much the baby actors aged between seasons, uh, I mean I might have just cast another baby but whatever, and they point out the contradictory nature of the school rules way more than they did in the book. I don't know, it felt like a bad move to me, like I said the world they live in is so cartoonish and unrealistic, pointing out stuff like that seems like a slippery slope. No, Reginald, I meant the metaphor, not the book title. You see, this is why I hardly ever reference you anymore. Those school ties look awfully Gryffindor to me. I mean, that probably wasn't intentional, but still a bit suspicious. They're still doing that thing where whenever the minor VFD agents are together, they sound really monotone and don't seem to react to anything weird, and... I mean, I can see in principle that they're going for deadpan humour, the likes of which I've praised in other things, but here it just sounds emotionless and dull. It's difficult to navigate the fine line between deadpan and just bad acting, and I really don't think this cast is good enough to pull it off, unfortunately. On the list of absolutely pointless additions to the episode, the librarian woman has to be pretty near the top. I mean, as soon as I saw her, I was like, okay, that's clearly another later book character they brought in early to flesh them out a bit more, but I couldn't for the life of me remember or guess which one, so I had to look it up. Even knowing who she is now, I really can't see what purpose most of the things she did served. Like, look at that extended sequence where she named books, then perfectly threw them over her shoulders to the exact spot on the bookshelf. I mean, 
What was the point in that? I mean, I guess it was impressive, but establishing that she's the world's most enthusiastic and supernaturally agile librarian did nothing to advance the plot of this episode. The advanced computer apparently now has janky facial recognition software, and the idea was they would put it out by the entrance to the school and it would see through any potential disguise that Olaf would put on, but of course it doesn't work because the vice principal is a crazy person who bought a NAF computer. In the book, the advanced computer did none of these things, and it's intentionally never addressed how it was supposed to help with the situation. Like, when the kids asked, how's it supposed to keep Olaf away, the adults would just wave their hands and say something vague like, oh, well, it's very advanced, or, well, you just don't understand computers. Vice Principal Nero is arguably in keeping with his book original, as they kept his general meanness and his obsession with the violin, but... I don't know, in this show, I think he definitely comes off as more of a loony than an asshole. It's exactly the same problem as I have with Neil Patrick Olaf. The show seems much more interested in making him funny than making him hateable, which does make the show more pleasant to watch, but it's not what the book character was about, in my opinion. In addition to increasing the Baudelaire's awareness of the higher purpose behind their suffering and their pre-existing connection to the Quagmires, Netflix once again gave Olaf his own B-plot, involving some behind-the-scenes struggle with the VFD agents and showing how he comes up with and puts his evil schemes into motion. Despite, like I said before, this stuff feeling super crowbarred in, I've warmed up to it slightly now that I've accepted the whole reboot versus adaptation situation. Please note the difference between accepted and personally approve of, my beautiful watchers. I have noticed that one or two of you seem to have had a bit of trouble with that distinction when I did that video recounting how Douglas Adams treated his adaptations over the years. I'd still say they're not adapting these books very well, but the stuff that they're adding in so unskillfully is admittedly more interesting than the original plot of the books. Come at me, bro. I was mildly impressed that the show noticed that it was slightly confusing that the Quagmire triplets found information about a deep secret society in a school library and tried to correct for this, i.e. arranged it so a VFD book that was supposed to be delivered to the Baudelaire's accidentally ended up there. If you were to read my notes on this episode, you would see two lines that simply read, Fear the baby. Flee the baby! Yeah, somehow the half-real, half-CGI Sunny is even more terrifying than the fully computer-generated monstrosity. Also, has anyone else noticed that her biting ability is becoming more and more of a general superpower by the episode? I mean, drilling through a metal bucket is one thing, but later she uses her teeth to weld some wires into the shape of glasses, and it's like... Her teeth couldn't possibly generate heat, so how the fuck is that working? There was a Spice Girls reference in this episode that didn't seem to fit the context and served no recognisable purpose other than to just acknowledge that the Spice Girls were once a thing. I guess this must be how everyone else felt when they watched Ready Player One. Speaking of utter randomness with no recognisable purpose, they seem to have decided to make Carmelita Spat's cake sniffer insult both literal and hypocritical, as she apparently sneaks into the kitchen at night to snort the sugar or flour off the top of baked products in a rather obvious reference to cocaine addiction. Olaf's first show-only interaction with Carmelita was the very definition of stranger danger. I mean, ye gods, a creepy old man telling a little girl to meet him in a dark secluded spot after school hours? They might might as well have added in him whispering, and be sure not to tell your parents about this. <laughs> I have to assume this was intentional, I mean, the show has made hints before about Count Olaf's sexual attraction to underage girls, but they didn't include any consequences for Carmelita in this episode as a result of her poor decision making, so I guess have fun getting molested, kids! Carmelita appears to have been given a much bigger role, both in the Baudelaire original story and in the new Count Olaf B-plot. Once again, they seem to be going for funny over hate sync, though in this case it's less of a deviation from the book because of how small her original role was. I didn't find it too weird that they added in some awkward sex chemistry between the older Baudelaire's and the Quagmire's, mostly because I suspected they were going to do it long before I saw the episode. Um, TV show makers love to see people getting flustered talking to the opposite sex. It's the trope that keeps on giving as far as they're concerned. However, I did find it a tad uncomfortable when Klaus started stammering about how nice Isadora looked when she was trying her best to look as much like his sister as possible. I'm not sure they thought that one through all the way. I did laugh at a few jokes in this, uh, mostly show original dry comments by Neil Patrick Harris and the antics of Roger Bart, but uh, uh, even the orphans managed to land the occasional winner. And my name is Carmelita! <laughs> Maybe I'm just tired, but I think she's improving. There's also the occasional funny random thing, like there being a rotary phone in the freezer and the funny all-male The Bodyguard parody. Speaking of which, our high Nathan Fillion, have you come to show everyone how it's done? Apparently, yes. Uh, it always amuses me when they bring genuinely amazing actors into shows like this and they inadvertently make it super clear that all the performances up until now have been average at best. It, uh, it kind of reminds me of the time that Timothy Dalton cameoed in Chuck. As for them bringing in Jack Snicket early, 
it looks like they've changed the character so much to suit Fillion that it might as well be a whole new person anyway, so I guess it doesn't really matter. The show's interpretation of Proofrock Prep kinda gave me mixed messages tonally. I mean, in the book it's supposed to be this universally dark, depressing place full of broken-spirited students, and they kind of stuck to that, but then they also showed them throwing pep rallies and cheering a lot. Olaf, wearing a turban, supposedly for religious reasons, could easily have gone in a slightly racist direction now that it's being presented in a medium that requires him to choose an accent to go with it, but they circumvented that by giving him a deep South American accent and just leaning into the fact that that doesn't suit the look. They also decided to make him act like one of those celebrity self actualization public speakers. It was one of those many, I guess it was kind of funny even if it was really pointless parts of the episode. Despite their desperate desire to pad things out, they still left some things from the book out altogether. For example, a surprisingly large part of the original story revolved around them hand making staples and it was exactly as interesting as that sounds. Unless I'm remembering something from the later books wrong, the spy glasses doubling up as deadly lasers is them taking influence from the 2004 Jim Carrey movie again. You probably noticed the first reference to the coveted sugar bowl making a much earlier appearance like many, many other things. That part of the climax now involves a four-way arm wrestle between the children and Count Olaf seems a tad weird to me, but in an episode full of weird additions, I guess it's not that high on the importance list. The special effects used for things like Count Olaf spinning around as his turban comes off and the car scene right at the end were even worse than what's popped up in past episodes. This was presumably either due to a lack of talent or budget, a stylistic choice, or my personal suspicion, pretending to be stylistic choice to hide the lack of talent or budget. In conclusion, as pointless as most of the padding was in this, I think I still overall prefer it to the book it's based on because that brought almost nothing new to the already extremely repetitive formula that Handler was utilising. However, fans of this book series would be well within their rights to feel annoyed that so much of what they liked about them has ended up buried underneath a ton of slapstick jokes and tangents. Do feel free to let me know in the comments if you are a fan and you disagree. I mean, maybe you felt there was enough of the original plot still intact to save it, I don't know. And that's about all I've got for now. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't be afraid of that like button. It's becoming worryingly more and more important in the quest to appease the mighty algorithm god of YouTube with every passing day. See you soon. Hello again, my beautiful watchers. I'm back for the other YouTubers you might like shout out, and this time around, I'm very excited to recommend The Maven of the Eventide. Simply put, Maven is a vampire critic. Movies, literature, original myths, and legends, she has an obsessive knowledge of all aspects of them and the effect that they've had on popular culture over the last century or two. She mostly concentrates on reviewing the vampires themselves in each form of media, but you'll also learn a lot about the movie, show, book, or adaptation along the way. I know for a fact that a lot of you will be interested in her show because you've not stopped asking me about that terrible essay I wrote about the evolution of vampires in films. Yes, she's covered that sort of thing too. I really can't recommend her enough. Her critiques are insightful, her production value is top notch, her performance is charming, her jokes are funny, her research is extensive, and her outfits are amazing! On top of that, her love and enthusiasm for the subject matter is palpable, which is always good. As usual, you'll find links in the video description. Check out the show now, thank me later.